Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, attending the session. What we'll try and do today is try and cover our collective experience on building batch and streaming applications for descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. So before we get started, I think I wanted to just share a small tidbit, which is that 95% of streaming tech applications as initially planned fail. Why would you think that uh, that would happen? Typically, what ends up happening is folks underestimate the complexity involved with streaming applications. So when you when you start building something, you are kind of designing for the least common denominator. And if, it, if you're designing for the least common denominator, typically what ends up happening is you discover issues as you kind of go along. And as you discover issues as you go along, you realize that the complexity, what you intended, and where you ended are two different things. And, and I think that's one of the things we want to cover as a part of our session today. And also, wanted to get a better sense for the audience. So how many of you have used batch-based applications in the past? Just raise your hands. How many of you have built streaming applications? Batch and streaming folks are using Lambda. And uh, are there any folks, uh, analytics folks in the audience? And I believe all of us are developers too. So, so we'll probably use this as a structure. Quick background, um, I'm Gurudev Karanth. Um, I, my experience has been in, in, uh, in different fields, in different areas. I was involved with the, I'm involved with a large, large retailer as we speak, building data-driven systems. I was a co-founder at a battery startup where what we were trying to do was pretty much what the Tesla power bank was trying to do and also kind of use more of usage patterns and demand patterns to start better predicting when we should use battery. Um, I, I was one of the founding members of the A-B testing platform team at eBay, which got eventually deployed at PayPal as well. Before that, I was a co-founder at uh, a marketing startup uh, running multi-channel lead acquisition and conversion applications. Mithun? Hey, uh, I'm Mithun. I currently work at a um, large retailer um, working on building data-driven systems. Before that, I was at uh, eBay, uh, started as a data analyst and uh, worked through different roles at different orgs and, and towards the end, I was a product manager for the experimentation platform there. Um, my interest lies in targeting, testing, measurement, and all that. Hey, uh, my name is Karthik, a developer, about 12 years now. Um, started my career with HP, built a few CDN products and infrastructure tools, then working with a large retailer building real-time solutions. Uh, good that you can continue. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. So if you start looking at uh, your data today, meaning we live in a world of data, we, where data is being produced, processed, analyzed, predicted, prescribed, so on and so forth. And while we're doing this, if you look at stand, uh, all the applications that we talked about, meaning there's a, there's a standard theme to all data-driven applications that we talk about, which is there is instrumentation that happens. Which then this information either goes through a message broker of sorts or goes into some sort of persistence layer where you're using either batch or stream. And then you're building some sort of OLAP tools on top of it. And then you get into data access. Data access could be users running reports. It could be machines. It could be bots, any of these. So these are typical patterns that we see. And as we are kind of doing that, what we realize is that it's very easy to build systems and, and, and understand when you look at the past. When you look at the past, what you're doing is you're building descriptive analytics, right? So where you're saying, I'm using data aggregation, data mining, so on and so forth, to provide insights into what happened in the past. But then you've got where you're at right now, which is where you can start getting into what can I do with the data that I've used in the past to predict what I need to do right now. And then you get into the next stage, which is the prescriptive side, which is how do I build systems and or bots to be able to define the different scenarios that, that come in the future. So you're typically straddling all of these different scenarios, if you will. 
And most of us are there where we are kind of looking at, and, and, and most, most companies, we have a combination of everything. Some, but you need to have your descriptive to get to predictive, and from predictive you get to prescriptive. Now, when you're still looking at the past, meaning, as I said, meaning you're looking at what happened, why, currently you're looking at what's gonna happen, and then what should you do. If you look at a data timeline, meaning I've just kind of looked at a, presented a year in this case, your batch kind of addresses the scenario where you're looking at everything previous to one day, or maybe even something as more recent than one day. But where, where, this, where this application actually comes to bear is more around historical reports. When you build scoring models, you're looking at historic data. So if you take the example of eBay, meaning one of the things that you could do is you could say, okay, who's gonna come to the site? You could look at your previous visit patterns, you could look at how frequently you visit, and you could say, okay, I can build a model that's gonna score how, if, what is the likelihood of this user coming to eBay? Similarly, if you look at Uber as well, and yesterday, last, last evening, there was a talk on Uber where they talked about different applications having different bars when it comes to the quality of data, availability of data. So if Uber needed to predict when I'm gonna use my, when I'm gonna get my next ride over the next, over the next week or so, it's, it's pretty, it's, looking at my historic patterns, that prediction could happen. But if they want to predict stuff like surge, the recent data is very important. I can't predict, histor I can't predict surge based pricing based on historic data. So the context is extremely important as well. Similarly, you can kind of look at the next day, which is when you start looking at your one hour to one day scenario, meaning these can be handled either by batch or stream. And this is where most folks straddle a combination of batch and stream. But then when you start getting into an hour or you start getting into a, into a minute, you're typically talking stream. And you're talking, if you're talking stream, you're talking about how everything is coming together and how you're using this information. So this is where if, Uber, if, if taking, just playing on the Uber example, if I took a cab ride from my house to the city, I need to get a cab back. So that information is something that Uber can use recent data on, or even for search, they could use recent data on. But at the end of the day, the data needs to be available and your processes and, your, um, and, 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 and the systems need to be able to leverage this data. And then typically when you look at analytics, what you're doing is you're looking at slice of data over time. You're basically building cohorts of users and you're doing customer analysis on who did what, when, and how, what does it cumulatively mean? which is very different when it comes to contextual applications which are looking at right now, and also kind of using a historical context, if you will. So, typical challenges that we end up seeing when it, when it comes to designing any of these applications is discovery, meaning what data should you use? Typically, organizations have a lot of data. Lineage may or may not be always be there. So, at the end of the day, meaning when folks are leveraging data, there is a discovery problem. Then you have multiple sources and data ordering, which becomes very, rele very relevant when it comes to stream, because if you're getting out of order events, if you're getting different streams of information arriving at different frequencies, at, 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 uh, with different latencies, then the complexity around building the stream application increases exponentially. But with batch, once the data has all arrived, if you're looking back in time, it's a lot easier to actually build that build those systems, but the relevancy of what you're building may may not always be consistent. And then data quality, which comes back to each of the different systems that you're talking about. Data conformity is, 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 is an important consideration that you need to kind of go through. And we'll get into some of the details as we kind of go through the, through the, uh, through the presentation. And then metric generation in terms of what should you look for, how does it make sense? And typically this is where if you're doing more complex pathing analysis, that's where you can do that in batch very easily. But when you want to do that in streaming, then you have to maintain all this context. If you have to maintain all this context, as you scale, from a volume perspective, your, crack, your cash actually grows exponentially, which means that now the design considerations around the system working, working reliably, are, 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 are a different league altogether. And the Uber talk last evening actually covered a lot of that. So if you guys missed it, definitely uh, go back and, 
and give it a listen. And then the scoring and machine learning part where you're making sense around the data is, 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 is again, depending on batch of streaming, your models need to be able to be deployed to be able to consider the incremental data elements when it comes to streaming, which is very different from how folks are typically used to doing them. And that's where you get into some of the neural networks and so on and so forth, and we'll, we'll touch on that towards the end. And decisioning is the action, which is where you get into bots and so on and so forth. So typically, if you look at the landscape, meaning you, you, on, the right, on the left, you've got the message queue. On the right, you've got structured and structured data. All of them come into your OLAP, and, and, and then you can get into visualization or consumption, which gets, which gets back to the access layer. And, and we've had some good experience working with um, Druid and Apex and so on and so forth, and, and these are technologies that are evolving that we would, that, uh, that we'll cover in, in, in more detail as we kind of go along. So if you look at the landscape, meaning think of, think of the overall landscape. From a source perspective, you've got structured and unstructured data. When you st want to start looking at any of the underlying building blocks, like infrastructure or data quality, the challenges that you will apply when it comes to structured or unstructured data from a data quality perspective is going to be very different when it comes to streaming. Because how you think about a data, how your data is going to arrive, and, 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 and how everything comes together is going to be very different. Similarly, any failures happening in any of these, any, any, at any of these points when it comes to the sources are, are, are things that you need to consider, which is, which is where the reliability of the system is very important. If the system fails, how you recover from it is very important. And how do you detect and monitor when failures happen, which is goes, gets back to the alerting side. And then the, 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 when the failure actually happens, then how do you recover from it, which, which gets back to, um, again, the applications and context, which is that when it comes to, uh, I'll, I'll go back to Uber as an example, for surge, meaning data one hour ago is not very relevant because, because it's very now based. But for anything that you're persisting that you're gonna use from a customer perspective, reliability is important. If there are delays, you need to be able to recover from it. Uh, so, so that's where I think the considerations are very different. And when it comes to processing as well, with streaming and batch, I mean, the extraction, the validation, typically what ends up happening with the extraction is folks end up looking at hard coding their sources, building pipelines. But when you're kind of scaling what you're building as a platform, then your extraction has to be generic enough and dynamic enough to be able to kind of evolve with the needs of your different sources so that you can plug different sources over time. And from a different source perspective, as the sources evolve and, 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 the, and the schemas evolve, how do you basically make sure that you're accounting for each of these? And as you're parsing your events, you need to make sure that you're validating them so that you're kind of making sure that what you're getting is, is in line with what you're, that you want to get. Because in most cases, you're relying on third party systems or, or external systems that may change, but your system is working independently and, and it has to handle these things gracefully. Versus failing, uh, versus failing, and you understanding after the fact, which basically has implications. Enrichment is 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 again from a streaming perspective, from a batch perspective, it's fairly simple to enable. But from a streaming perspective, there are complexities around how you basically enrich your data, and attribution, transformation, aggregation, and then once you do go through all of these ETL steps in the process side, then you go go back into the store where you can either kind of do some sort of uh, HDFS or an OLAP. And then access-wise, you've got a different reporting, analytics layers, and ad hoc exploration applications and bots. So the challenges are very different. So I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll let Karthik, uh, sorry, Mithun now take over and talk about some of the evaluation criteria that you need to consider uh, when it comes to designing your different systems. Thank you, Vijay. Um, so taking a step back, now, let's say you want to start with a brand new pipeline. Uh, how do you get started about it? And the idea here is that you know you need to start with evaluation criteria, and it will. There are certain things that are common across different needs, um, and there are certain things that you need to handle them differently. So um, we try to put it in different categories and starting with on the architecture side, uh, pipelines. Uh, there will be a need of micro pipelines and isolated processing. Uh, there can be uh, reporting needs, there can be uh, processing needs, like going back to the example of uh, different workloads and different 
uh, uh, processing standards, uh, you might want to look at having that support for that. Uh, moving on to the scalability, uh, the needs are different. Uh, with batch processing, it's more around like read bursts. What that means is like you'll be loading large amount of data at the same time, whereas the stream processing, it's more about latency and it's more about continuous uh, stream of data. Uh, but what is more important in stream processing is auto scaling. Uh, you will have, depending on uh, the, the, uh, the the company and, and, and their business use case, there will be peak times, there will be, uh, the load will be differential. It's not going to be a standard. It's not going to be um, a stable one. So you need to make sure that this uh, auto scaling features there. Uh, reusable computational object. Uh, over a period of time, you'll start building a lot of technical debt. So it's very important uh, for you to have those operators where you can start reusing everywhere, uh, replicating everywhere, and, and it, be, it becomes easy and, and more manageable. Uh, pipeline replication is uh, also an, an uh, additional um, uh, feature on, on the pipeline stage. Where, uh, uh, eventually, you'll get to a point you need to start thinking about parallelism, uh, parallelizing your, your load. And uh, instead of rebuilding the whole pipeline, uh, if you're able to replicate the pipeline, that's a lot more helpful. Uh, scalability and robustness is a standard feature. Uh, there's nothing uh, more to say. It's, it's very important. Uh, to make sure that we have a highly available uh, infrastructure. And uh, out of order processing, it's more important for stream. Um, I, I know we have a couple of talks uh, with Apache Beam and, and all that. So um, as you start looking into data and, and uh, like event data and, and more uh, sequential based uh, applications, then out of order press, uh, processing becomes as important as you can. And the last thing is again latency. It's, uh, Given the nature of use cases that you will normally solve with the stream processing, latency becomes extremely important. Uh, imagine a case where you have a network failure and you want to detect, detect it as it happens. Uh, things like that, examples like that, uh, you want to make sure that you have, you have your latency uh, checked. There's no uh, build up there. So one, one initial point is, if you're building a system for four nines versus five nines, if you're building it with, with uh, for, from out of ordering processing, the cost implications of how you actually what will support five nines versus four nines are going to be very different. Um, and, and, and it's just that incremental fifth digit that's basically going to change how you basically uh, account for your costs and trade-offs because those are two important things that you're playing with and also the context in the application. Sure. So yeah, um, so some of them we try to capture it here. Um, Four nines versus again uh, availability. Uh, these are again standard features. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, what's important here is one other thing is the semantics. Uh, when you try to, again, it, it goes case by case. Uh, but typically for stream processing, you want to look something at exactly once, depending on accuracy, depending on the businesses that you have. Batch processing again. Uh, this is more on the data quality route, more on uh, on on that front, uh, where you wanted to ensure there are enough audits placed, enough monitors and alerts placed, and, and ensure. Uh, the quality of the data. And the last thing, I think batch processing, uh, eventually it's, you know, it will get important, you know, as you start mm -hmm. thinking about the storage needs, uh, the resource cleanup and all that. And uh, similarly for, for an OLAP, and now let's say, now you have your uh, evaluation done for your stream processing engine and your batch processing engine. Um, now all this data should land somewhere, right? Uh, so that's your OLAP. Um, so ingestion, right? Starting with ingestion, like, you know, you. One of the idea that we have is uh, try to think of uh, one solution that can support both batch and real time, uh, that has a good amount of uh, features that will have ensure scalability and robustness. And what's important here is the granularity. You know, uh, eventually it, it'll it'll play out there. You know, uh, the granularity that you're trying to ingest that will define the features towards the end, towards on the analytics layer, visualization layer, and also your latency and all that your standard features. Um, going into the storage, uh, trying to touch that alert is also your roll-up ratio. This is a little bit of compression, what compression techniques, what aggregation, uh, how we are trying to think about that. That will be important. Um, where you store the data, like tiers, right? Hot and cold, uh, you know, SSDs versus your, your, your disks versus your cache. All those will start to play eventually. Um, going back to the, the slide that we have about analyst need or, or, or user need across the data, like uh, data 
you want one report that goes in the last one minute to the last one year. So how do you manage that with the lowest possible latency? So things like that will, 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 will start to play. So you need to take your need and take it back to your design of your tiers and your memory and all that. Um, availability, again, this is a standard feature. Nothing more to stress on that. Fault tolerant, high throughput. Analytics, right? Uh, so the last thing is your needs. There are two ways to think about it. Either you, uh, you, you support very standard features, but make sure that uh, latency and those are important, or you also want to have as complicated or as complex statistical needs. So it's, it's really good to start evaluating what are supported and how can they support it. And, uh, and also how the data can be accessed. Like, for example, uh, querying data through REST API, uh, something like, like Druid that, that, that allows that. And uh, query time aggregation versus pre-aggregated data, like, you know, cube versus uh, query time aggregation. Um, so those start to play important. So that's definitely part of, should be part of a evaluation criteria. Choices. So looking at this, uh, as we went ahead, uh, went about designing a pipeline, there are different choices that we have. Um, some, again, the idea here is that you start with the criteria, you look at your choices, take this back, rank them, and then finally you will arrive at your answer. That's, that's the overall idea. And now moving on, um, so I'll, I'll go to Karthik to uh, dig a little deeper into the challenges and the design considerations. As we start, uh, so we, uh, we worked across this, and then as we start looking at that, what are some of the considerations that we have and what are the challenge, challenges that we have? Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, so as we went deeper, um, we started, you know, as we started developing, uh, we learned a lot on the journey, and um, I want to, like, uh, uh, start talking about uh, some of the changes, challenges that we went through. Um, you know, some of these would look, you know, pretty straightforward and, you know, sound common sense, but, you know, uh, stating them explicitly and, you know, having them in your mind would really help you guys. Uh, a lot of things can be done through batch processing. So, you know, right during the technical design days, it's it's important to ask ourselves what, you know, what kind of uh, apps and what kind of challenges we are going to solve using batch and, you know, keep very minimal to real time, you know, very minimal analysis. Uh, one of the things that involves batch processing, especially when it comes to writing data, uh, you know, mostly batch is going to, pull data from another source, so which means that you're going to give us some sort of a query. So it's, you know, you can be very smart in how you want to query and how you want to load data into an OLAP layer. You know, basically when I say OLAP layer, I assume that you're going to use that to query very fast. Uh, so, you know, you need to understand if you're going to rewriting data or it's going to be a replay, then you may end up rewriting data or overwriting data. So you want to understand the complexities that involves. So, you know, you want to be very clear on what you're going to query and what you're going to store and what you're going to replace. Uh, one of the other things is uh, when it, you know, if you're going to use a stream processor to do batch processing, then, you know, read burst happens. Uh, so the analysis of how your operators or how your operations are going to set, how your, you know, partitions are going to happen and what your parallelism strategy is going to be, is going to be very different to real-time processing. Uh, so when you're writing your classes, you want to give considerations to those classes. So for example, if, if your processor is as a requirement to look at a you know a, a third party or a you know outside API or you know some sort of a caching mechanism, then you know you want to look at those at this level. Uh, again, it's very important in the design phase that you sit and consider what your workflow is, what are your operations in that workflow, what complexities would involve in each of those operations, you know, in terms of latency building and everything there. Um, so you know you want to always keep your you know, see what your Java options tuning look like, and you always want to work on that. Uh, the other one that happens, uh, especially in batch processing, is is duplication. Especially if your batch process fails, uh, then you know, if you, if it's not like a Kafka kind of a source, then you know where you have a nice offset, and you know with a group ID and a topic, you know what offset you've read. You know, in this case, it could be a case, you know, where you're like reading bunch of data from one partition in a hive, you could, you know, say that, okay, I, you, do not, you may not realize whether you have processed that one particular row or not. You know, that's when you need to understand, you know, the differences in semantics, uh, how your processor handles those kind of semantics. So that's very important to understand how at most once differs from at least once and exactly once. At this point of time also, you know, you guys would have already worked on how to handle duplicates. 
this allows us to not uh, you know, create duplicates in the OLAP layer, so you may want to take care of that. In case if you guys uh, create duplicates, you, know, you want to think through that. You know. um, one of the other things that I really want to touch is resource cleanup, because uh, batch processes, what I've seen is that you know, it's going to create intermediate files. Uh, you know, say, for example, if you're going to read a source, you're going to read a source, process it, keep it in an intermediate source, and then some other process may pick it up and then you know, load it in, in, into a OLAP layer or into an, another table. So you don't want to create you know, duplicate data sources and all those things. So you want to make sure that resource cleanup is clean. Uh, that also includes your class objects and everything. Uh, quickly moving on to the stream processing layer. Uh, well, it's important because uh, before you start, you want to sit uh, as a team, understand the overall workflow, uh, know what uh, each, what are the operations involved and what are the complexities involved in each operation. Because you may have a case where you have to do an external lookup to a metadata using a REST API call, or you may want to do a lookup with using you know, some sort of a, a memory database like you know, readers or HPs or something. Uh, so some of these things would build latency, some of this would affect the overall throughput uh, use, you know, within a window, um, because that is very important, because then that will, uh, that will dictate what your parallelism strategy is going to be, what is your partitioning factor it's going to be. Um, what all that also allows is that you, know, you have a system that sits uh, well, and you have a system that is defined at an atomic level. You have each operation defined at atomic level. You are, you, you are recognizing the complexity at an atomic level, and you're handling those atomic levels. For example, if you, know, you want to have one operation that just performs lookups, and you, know, you handle all those complexities and partitioning for that particular operation. You may have one operation that does extensive network I.O. You know, for example, if it's going to write to an external API, then you know, you want to see how you want to increase the number of ports it writes to or number of threads it writes to so that you don't build latency. Uh, the next one is out of order event processing. I think you know, Apache Beam has come up, so I, I would suggest that you, know, you should just use it. You should learn how to use it. Uh, but if you're not using it, uh, you know, a couple of strategies that come that are pretty straightforward is you know, if you're doing it for logs, then you can think of you know, overwriting the logs until a certain criteria is met for you guys to analyze and then you know push it to uh, persistent storage uh, the other one is you know it's very you know for sessionizing is this one sorted downstream is basically add an id so that you know you are able to associate an id to a particular session of events and then you know move it to uh, downstream so that way you don't build the latency uh, and then you can do some sort of a sorting uh, mechanism uh, in the downstream uh, for all these things uh, for both batch and uh, Streaming, a couple of things are very important, and that's the management and data quality. Uh, acknowledgement, acknowledging that data quality issues are going to be there is the first step. Um, your monitoring and your alerting tool uh, should complement that, and also it should complement a nice auto healing mechanism because in real time, if something goes down, you need to have a tool that would bring your application up again and start the process again, so that you know you are not like having a downtime and not able to process data during that downtime. Uh, so you want to monitor, you want to be on top of things at all times, so your monitoring alerts should be based on latency, throughput. You want to see how the Kafka is performing or you know, what are your data sources performing, and then how the overall trust plane is performing, and then how your data storage is, persistent data storage is performing in terms of access and querying. Uh, one of the things that we do is uh, use error ports. So basically what you have started doing is Whenever there is an issue, we move that to an airport or an you know, endpoint from which we can use it for replay. Uh, coming again to replay, uh, it's, again, that should be given a lot of thought and consideration. Whoever is working on a you know, uh, streaming application, replay is very important. I would say that you want to build replay and make your stream processor as a special case of it. Uh, it should be flexible and customizable, which you know, what I mean by that is if things go wrong and bad, you want, and when you know what has gone bad and what the uh, corrective mechanism is, uh, your replay should quickly support it and you should be able to process it. Uh, you know, the error port should Im Im uh, help you on that because then, you know, giving you an example, say if you have errors in your tuples or in your inputs, read them, put them in a Kafka topic. 
and your replay, once you know what the correct mechanism is, your replay should be able to pick that from the Kafka topic and write it back to your persistent storage. Uh, coming back to the OLAP layer, yeah. Uh, okay, so if I understand correctly, your question is, uh, when should I do the error processing? Should I, as I read it from Kafka, or after I read it and then process it, find the error, and then go back? So there are actually three scenarios in this case, quickly to answer this question. So one is, as you read it from Kafka, you find out that that's an error. I would suggest that you write it to an error port, which is basically an error Kafka topic. It could be that if you have six operations in your streaming process, and if you find that error in the fourth process, you know, and say that you're gonna keep these errors and all those incoming data as JSONs. I would say that, you know, create a customizable JSON, you know, identify what that, you know, what that operation is causing that error and also the data that is having that error. That way when you're reprocessing it, you know exactly which operation had that error and if that operation had, had, had that error, what error it was and then you can process it. If it's in the upstream like the first operator that actually reads the Kafka data, then it's straightforward. Then again, you know, it, you know that which operation actually caused that error. You can read that data and then you can process it. Uh, can you take it offline? Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, so coming to the data OLAP layer, uh, I know that the, this is very use case driven. Everyone will have a different use case. We try to be as generic as possible in this. Uh, you know, especially when it came to you know, querying petabytes of data in a second. Uh, I'm, we are looking from that perspective here. Uh, so we have a case where, you know, we may have a case where, you know, you're ingesting data both in real time and batch time, which means that uh, you need to think of scalability, uh, you know, the data structure, the data schema very differently, which means that when you're storing data or persisting data, you can have longer segment granularities in batch time Whereas because of the nature of real time, you want to have shorter segment granularities. I would suggest one hour with a window of about 10 minutes. That's about it for real time. That's what uh, we use. Uh, again, when it comes to the querying, especially when it comes to real time querying, you know, you guys wanted to use something like an 80-20 rule, like the Pareto's rule, because what we know is that you know 80% of the data is not queried more than 20% of the time. So you can create an odd structure, like say last two days of data in the odd tier. Basically, you know, you know, disk or a, um, you know, something else that will give you fast read access, and then keep move the uh, rest of the data to some sort of a, you know, HDFS kind of a deep storage, which will not be used much. Because there, what you can do then is once the data moves to deep storage, you can have batch process running, you know, which is not dependent on latency. Uh, again, one of the important thing is availability and fault tolerance. Uh, fault tolerance in I throughput, I think, you know, every guy, everyone knows you, what they are and how important they are. Uh, in terms of analytics, I mean, you know, two things about the analytics. Suppose if your tool is going to read data from this layer, then you want good support for it, which means that you have some native classes, or you know, it should have a REST API so that you can quickly pull, you can write your queries, you can do aggregations on those queries using a REST API. Um, I think that is important because you know, uh, you know, if I don't know how many people write Ive, you know. Most of the times what happens is you have to create another layer after we query the data and push it to a reporting layer, which may be very time and cost consuming. Uh, well, the final thing, visualization. Uh, I, I, we strongly feel that there is no one tool that is going to support all. So if you're going to use, if, you're, if a visualization tool is going to do a lot of analysis, then you want to do something like a Jupyter Notebook or a Zeppelin uh, or even Metabase that supports Druid. Uh, if you are looking at into leadership dashboards where you're going to read the metrics, build nice dashboards with charting facility, then I would think something like, uh, again, uh, something like Tableau or something. Uh, and on the third level, if, if you're looking at something like you know, charts and uh, feature set that support uh, you know, statistics and other things, then I would think of something like Superset. That's part of IBM's product. Uh, usability. Uh, yeah, I mean, when, when as, as the tool matures, as people start using it, you're thinking of personalization, 
and you know uh, restrictive assets and security and everything. Uh, but deep inside, I just want to give one more thought. Uh, just make sure that you know when you're using tools like Druid, it's going to fetch a lot of data very fast. Whereas when it comes to the UI component, it may not process the data as fast as what your uh, you, uh, the Druid is doing. So you want to be very clear how you want to aggregate data and how you process the query data and move it back to the UI layer. Uh, with this, yeah, let, let me just take it from here. Yeah, That's good. Do this. So, Do yeah. Thanks, Karthik. Yeah. So going back to what Karthik was saying, from the visualization perspective, meaning you're typically talking about, you know your user patterns. So if you're building typical queries and custom UIs, you know how you're going to query your data, which means that that has implications on the previous step, which is in the OLAP layer, because you could basically say, my data is aggregated in one second chunks, 30 second chunks, whatever have you, right? So, so and, and that has a previous, that, that has an implication on how you process your data on the stream side or on the batch side. So it's all linked together. So you can kind of say that as you're building a system, you can kind of think about it independently because independently it has to work. But at the same time, there are dependencies that you have to kind of consider on uh, when you're kind of designing this overall, um, overall stack. So on the data science side, meaning assuming that all the data exists, you can kind of think about data science either at the basic data science either at the OLAP level, or you could basically say I'm doing some of that on the stream side, or you could say I'm doing some of that on the on the on the batch side. And and what you can do in each of these scenarios is very different. When you start getting into supervised learning and so on and so forth, meaning it's really a function of the application you're trying to run. And and from an application perspective, meaning supporting SVMs or decision trees or or, or base, you're doing Markov chains, so on and so forth, meaning all of these work very differently. You can kind of, some of these things work as the data arrives and you can incremental score. Some of these things need series of data that you can actually run your algorithms on. And, 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 and that's, where, that's where the data scientists actually need to, uh, need to come into the mix in terms of how you kind of set all of these up. On the unsupervised learning side, neural network side, this is, meaning neural networks is evolving, there are a lot more use cases now, and, and working with a small set of data, incrementally increasing it to what you want, is probably where, where once you, is, is where you kind of spend your energies in terms of building your models. Once you build your models, then you think about how am I going to deploy them, and depending on the use case you're going to do, leverage. So if it's an A-B test system that you're building, or if it's some sort of a, analytic systems you're, you're building, then the development pipeline associated with where you do your processing will change. But if you're starting to look into something that's more real time, like a search pricing model, you're basically accounting for all of these data points individually, scoring everything individually, and then kind of putting it all together. And then as you go into bots, you know, everything needs to be autonomous because the, scorings are ha the scoring is happening and you're considering all these different scores together in order to basically deliver a particular experience. So in a nutshell, meaning go back to the use case. Batch works in a lot of cases, but it's all about the context. Building a, in going back to the Uber example, search works very differently from your regular finding a driver or sending an ETA or something on those lines. So the use case is very critical in terms of how, what components get used, and, and that goes back into reliability, which is the four nines and five nines and so on and so forth. The real-time pipelines aren't difficult to stand up. It's very easy to stand them up. However, to get it operationally right, it's very challenging because many points of failure, and, and, and that's, where, that's where the more you know about where things are failing, you have your audits, your monitoring, your alert, alert, alerting mechanisms in place, that's where you'll, you'll start getting into more, uh, uh, what do you say, better systems, if you will. Having, and then optimizing your data for fast querying is very critical because you need to know your data and you need to know how your users are querying the data. Depending on that, you could basically, and this goes back to either if it's a user or if it's a bot, which goes back to low latency reads and how you plan for it. And then continuously test, which means that you're kind of, you, you need to have your monitoring in place to make sure that you're detecting failures because it could be something that you control or it could be based on external systems and have always have a plan B, which is things are going to fail, 
so know how to recover elegantly. Thank you. We'll take some questions. Yeah, it's more about thinking. Uh, so the question is, do you have a recommended solution, or uh, uh, or is it more of a problem statement? So I think it's a combination of both. So what we try to do is, based on our different systems that we've built, we've realized that the needs that you need to look at have have been have been fairly complex, and that's where, depending on the use case, the stack that you put together could be more complex or could be less complex. You know, so so this is to start with the needs. Uh, we didn't get into the details of any given application given given the time consideration. All right, thank you. Um, we'll be we'll be here for questions. So if you have questions, please come in.